Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly McDonald, the CEO and co-founder of Kindu, and I am here today on our very first episode of Swiping Stories. I'm so excited about this. I could barely sleep last night. I woke up like <laughs> the clock every hour to be like, is it time yet? Is it time yet? So we've got a great episode today with uh, Jamie Sire and Emily Fedner and my co-host and our CMO at Kindu, Amy Romero. Um, we're going to be chatting with these uh, ladies on all things food influencing and just all other stuff that's going on in the world that they can share their thoughts and opinions on. Um, we've had some really terrific experiences with Jamie and Emily. And one of the things we're gonna aim to do in this episodic series that we'll be doing across multi-channel platforms is really asking influencers who are successful in not just being on Instagram and like having a lot of followers, but actually helping with the brands that they're representing see success too and a return on the investment that they're getting. And so these guys have just been fantastic to work with in the past, um, have gotten, had gotten amazing and glowing reviews from the brands that we've uh, set them up with. And we can't wait to have a long conversation with you guys today. So thanks for joining us on this first episode. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. So excited awesome. to be here. <laughs> yeah. And so Amy, I'm going to turn over to Amy Romero. Amy is my good friend, mm -hmm. as well as a mother of two, a fantastic executive, and also as a mother of a fur baby. So Amy, I'm going to hand over to you guys. I'm going to be in the chat. So folks, jump in, introduce yourself, ask questions there, and we'll get to audience questions towards the end of the episode. I know that we asked for some questions uh, a couple of days ago from some of you who sent them in. So thanks for that. We have some that we'll definitely get to. And we're really excited uh, to have you all here. So thanks so much. And I'll turn it over to you, Amy. Take it away. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kelly. Hi, everyone. How are you? Welcome to Swiping Stories. This is our premiere episode. And it is multi-channel. As Kelly mentioned, we will have it on our podcast, also called Swiping Stories, and all social channels. Um, but we figured what a better topic to start off with than food and spirits. I mean, everyone loves it, everyone hates it, everyone has an opinion of it and can't get enough of it. So we wanted to invite, as Kelly mentioned, Jamie and Emily here, we've had such wonderful um, feedback from the brands that they have worked on with us through Can Do. Always so poised, so professional, so authentic. And what, why not, hear from them, you know, like how you got started and, and, you know, how you made it and what are the lessons you've learned along the way to both influencers and brands for tuning in. So we'll go through, thanks so much for the questions, but we'll go through and ask you um, some of the main ones that popped up, Emily and uh, Jamie, um, but let's first like um, hear from you two um, and um, like, you know, just a little introduction. So I'll start with you, Jamie, just a little intro. So Jamie is, um, uh, the host of uh, Food Network Obsessed. I don't know who's out there, but I am Food Network Obsessed. <laughs> so if you um, definitely check out Jamie's podcast, Food Network Obsessed, hysterical name. And um, she's also um, been a guest host on Beat Bobby Flay, who um, has been her mentor. So really interesting. You've also been an ESPN host, an Emmy Award winner, you're an amazing writer and obviously content creator and quite influential. So, uh, Jamie, uh, welcome. Uh, thank, thank you so much for that uh, <laughs> that glowing um, introduction. Yeah, um, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm super excited to be here um, and chatting with all of you just about um, what Emily and I do and, and kind of how we approach, um, you know, social media and, and brand partnerships and that kind of thing. But I'll just take you uh, back a little bit more uh, even than what Amy mentioned. You know, I started out on Instagram like a, a majority of probably most people. You know, it was just another social media platform, you know, sharing photos and snippets of my life. Um, at the time, I was working actually in San Francisco as a sports reporter for uh, what at the time was CSN Bay Area. It's now NBC Sports Bay Area. Um, you know, so a lot of my following, especially early on, came from just being somebody that was, you know, on local television, you know, covering the San Francisco Giants through two of their series runs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, you know, as Amy, Amy mentioned, I, I moved on to ESPN um, and anchored Sports Center there, um, covered the Little League World Series, uh, among another uh, other assignments um, for four years. So I continued to kind of gain my followers from that. Um, but then in 2017, ESPN actually did 
some massive um, talent layoffs. And I was unfortunately part of that. There was a hundred people, uh, which doesn't sound like a crazy amount for you know a large company like ESPN, but they were all front facing on air people. So suddenly mm -hmm. I had no job. Um, We've all been there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, throughout all of that though, I was, you know, a food obsessed person, you know, posting food photos on my Instagram and actually a coworker had encouraged me to start a food blog, which I did back in 2011, which was mostly like sharing recipes and that kind of thing. It was definitely just a creative outlet for me um, at the time. I think, you know, when I got laid off, um, it, it became a little bit more than that. You know, I was already kind of working towards wanting to transition into food television just because mm -hmm. that was what I was really passionate about. And I think the layoff kind of just forced me to do that. Um, you know, whether I, I was ready to or not, about a month after the layoff actually is when I got my first email from a brand asking me if they want, if I wanted to collaborate. And I had no d idea of what I was doing. I kind of just made it up <laughs> as I went along. Um, and, and here we are, you know, four years later, and I'm still obviously, you know, working in the media space, um, hosting Food Network's first ever podcast, Food Network Obsessed, and still, you know, trying to, to do television. But, you know, I didn't realize or think at the time when I got that email four years ago that it could be a viable source of income. And as we saw throughout the last year, you know, especially with all my TV gigs getting canceled, it really was like my main source of income. So, um, you know, it's it's been something that kind of came by accident, but something I've I've really enjoyed. And my boyfriend and I have basically mil built a, a media studio out of our apartment, and uh, we've had a lot of fun doing it. So I'm excited to be here today. You know, talking a little bit more about that. Oh, that's it's so great. Because, I mean, your 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 past is so fascinating. <laughs> I, I do believe in becoming an influencer, and you're so much more. You you know, um, is um, you know, content creator, writer. You're a traveler, blog too. Uh, tra you have travel as well, and um, but. You know, I have to ask, and I'm going to sound like such a mother because, like, my mother still doesn't even know what I do. You know, she gets everyone else, and she's like, "What is it you do again?" I'm like, it's marketing, mom. You know, like, <laughs> but what did you study? Like, you know, like, were you interested oh, okay. in being an actor? Did you study journalism? Because you know how you mentioned, like, and then ESPN picked me up. I'm like, yeah, but see, ESPN doesn't call me. I'm not on the <laughs> radar. Nothing. So. How did like what? How did you get in there? Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to give you guys like I felt like I was already like rambling. No, but, um, I, like, so I, I was giving I you like, a cracker. Like, like, cliff notes. Um, yeah, I mean, I went to school for broadcast journalism. I mean, I okay. I think I'm one of the the few that like in Stop high right school I, I was like, this is what I want to do. I'm gonna hone in on this. Pick a school based on their broadcasting program, um, and I you know like. So many people obviously switch majors, switch directions, which is totally fine. I, you know, knew what I wanted to do and kind of like focused in on that. So I went to Washington State um, and, and was part of their broadcasting program and, you know, did internships at news stations during um, during college and kind of just worked my way up through the ranks. Like anybody in television will know and tell you it's like, you know, hopping around to different markets. So my first job was in my hometown, actually in Great Falls, Montana. And then yeah. my second job was in San Diego. So I actually made a pretty big jump um, for that second market and then moved on to, to more of a regional sports network in San Francisco and then to ESPN. But um, but I guess the short answer, yeah, I went to, I did go to school for television. Um, and it's so luckily a, I'm still a, doing it. A grandparent slash parent. <laughs> I'm gonna put myself in the parent thing question, but you know, I had to ask, you know, yeah, it's really absolutely. fascinating, fascinating. A career. Emily. Okay. So Emily also has, um, like, it's just amazing the amount of hats the two of you wear. <laughs> I get tired uh, just by the stress of swiping stories, but you know, hey, yes, sir. Um, so, you know, um, and also um, for those listening at Jamie Sire um, on Instagram, please check her out and obviously check out her podcast. Um, but Emily Fedner, um, you might know her at Food, Food Lovers Diary. You're um, a very talented writer, and you are a chef, and you are a co-owner of Petite Pasta Joint in Brooklyn. So all those New Yorkers out there, please mention it out. Um, you know, uh, you have to go and check out Petite Pasta Joint. Um, and, you know, so you're obviously um, been an on-camera host, content creator, and quite influential as well. So you've really been picking up some steam. Tell us, how did you get started, and um, you know, what was your what was your road? How'd you get here? 
Hello, everyone. Um, hi, so excited to be here um, and chat about my favorite thing, which is food. Uh, and uh, my road was pretty non-traditional. Um, I have loved food and restaurants since I was a child. I was practically a dictator when me and my parents would go on vacation when I was little. I was like, no, we are going to that restaurant. I would get to the condo. I would open up whatever book. It was before the internet. I'd be like, no, 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 we have to go there. So I love food always. And I really started to appreciate food as a marker of culture because I grew up in a Russian Jewish household. So my parents are Russian and growing up in Columbus, Ohio, I noticed right away that the things that I was eating after school, you know, the smoked salmon caviar and stuff was not the same as what my friends were eating after school. So early <laughs> on, I made that connection between food and culture. But, um, you know, time went on. I got my first job at a restaurant. I was 15 as a hostess at a local pub. And I was like, hmm. I really like this. Like I kind of hate it in the way that you commiserate when you work at a restaurant, but I also right. really love it. Um, and I started working in restaurants from then on. I went to college. I actually went to NYU with a, the intention of being a pre-med major. It was always ahead in science and math. So I had, uh, so I went to NYU, I was doing pre-med and, and I just, something clicked in me that was like, as much as I'm interested in medicine and science and math, I really, find myself to be more of a creative person at heart. So to really whittle it down, really, you know, and condense it, I ended up graduating from Ohio State, where I'm from, Ohio State. No, I do not watch football, don't ask me. <laughs> um, and I ended up um, starting my Instagram Food Lover's Diary when I was at Ohio State. It was always just a hobby. I was always working in restaurants, posting about food, exploring food. And something else I just recently remembered, which I think is kind of funny and relevant, when you're a senior in high school, at least we got to pick a senior project. And my senior project, which one of the teachers made fun of, was picking out the best restaurants for each cuisine. Like, this is the best Italian restaurant, Columbus. This is the best Japanese restaurant. And I remember my teacher at the time was like, that's not a project, that's just going out to eat. Who else? Hey, guys. <laughs> okay. Um, so Does she anyway. follow you today? That's the question. Does she follow you today? I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Anyways, I have worked almost every position in the restaurant industry. I started my career as a publicist for chefs and restaurants after college. Uh, eventually, I realized I wanted to literally get in the fire, so I became a stage. I came intern at a restaurant kitchen, became a line cook, served, etc. And I've had many adventures along the way, including with Food Lovers Diary and working with brands. And I'm sure we're going to get into all of them, but I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I also forgot to mention, um, not, I did mention what sounds brighter you are, and we'll get into that, but... Um, Emily um, has two cookbooks too, so you, you know, it makes sense though. I mean, uh, you know, you were going there mixing, you know, medicine, it's a science, and so is though recipes and thinking about, you know, totally. I can't do it. Like, I'm not someone who'd be like, this needs a little, you know, cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know? Science. You know, it, it, but it is a bit, you know, there's something there that, you know, it, you know, musicians are very mathematical. So there is a math, I think, to your an amazing recipe creator. So, yeah. um, so while you were doing studying the brain, you really, it started coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yes. So let's get into um, the, um, the brands because we do want to, um, we have brands and we have everyday folks um, like, um, like Kelly and I and, um, and then influencers. So we're all um, really curious how you do work with brands and the tips, especially this past year. Um, so before I actually get into that, I'm sorry, I wanted to quickly share how did you two meet? Because that's like <laughs> kind of a, a funny story there. It is a funny story. So I am a shameless human being. I, if I saw a celebrity, I would come up to them. In my eyes, Jamie was like a little bit of a, like a celebrity in the sense that we had a mutual friend and I kept seeing her pop up on his Instagram, um, Jeremy Jacobowitz, formerly Brunch Boys. Um, and I knew she had worked at ESPN. I knew she did all this stuff with like Food Network and whatever. And we were at an event together and I just literally came up behind her and tapped her on the shoulder and I was like, hey. So I recognize you from Instagram, um, and she says she recognized me. I'm not sure if she did. No, I didn't. Um, no, because we're all the same, like our mutual friend. Like obviously, like would feature both of us like separately. Um, but yes, yes, I, I, I actually saw her, and I was like, I was the one that was like, oh, I should really go say hi. But like, what if she doesn't know who I am? And that's like awkward. And like, I just like get in my own head, and then I just like didn't say anything. 
so um, I was very, I was very appreciative that that Emily like decided to just like have no filter and be like, hi, well, Emily. I was there to act and not really think. So I came up to her and I said hi. And the funniest <laughs> part of our entire friendship is that we maybe hung out twice, <laughs> and then I went to Brazil in the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, I stayed there for months. And Jamie, who was a, such a recent friend but happened to live near me kindly and graciously offered to water my plants for three months. So for three months, we were barely even friends. Jamie was watering my plants. She had a key, she to this day has a key to my apartment and was coming in and watering and FaceTiming me. We were just, cause we were trapped kind of unexpectedly. Um, and it wasn't until like after I got back last summer that we became very close. Yeah. I actually referred you to Kindu actually too, because it was, I, I remember that. you and I, I met in Brazil. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I would be here if you weren't for Jamie. <laughs> Emily was so yeah. like shocked that I would offer. And I was like, what, why, like what, who are your friends that aren't offering? <laughs> <laughs> it's like other people make it such a big deal to go and water plants and uh, for three months. That's I think it's like the Midwest in both of us that we're yeah. Yeah. Then, like, of course I, I'd <laughs> offer. I don't know if I'd actually show up and do it though. You, they don't like, I, would offer something know that. That I, I mean, you can cut. Oh no, that's your stairs. I was going to say, you, I thought you could see like your, my, my plant baby, like right next to you. Uh, oh, not that yeah, one. That's a, yeah. That was a different one. Well, yeah, I, I could do it. It's just, they wouldn't be alive when you go back. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into the yeah. um, brands. Um, so you know, so you're approached by uh, many different food, spirits, and travel brands. And um, so, how do you, um, you know, everyone's all about authenticity, and there's constantly the conversations about like, well, let the let the influencers do their thing. Don't try to overdirect them. And, and you know, we're aware, we're aware as marketers. However, we have to still make sure we're checking that box of so there's certain things that we need to do and but we don't want it to sound like a bunch of marketing speak so like how do you work with a band, brand you know to like make the message that they have listed out don't forget this bullet 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 that's me um uh sound authentic like how do you do that what's that how's that how does that start uh Jane, well, why do you start? I, I can start yeah, yeah um, I'm sure i'll feed off you <laughs> We'll go back and forth. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been pretty lucky, honestly, that most of the brands that that I've had the opportunity to work with that, that reach out and like truly want to work with me, like they want, they like specifically want me to present things in my voice. Like they understand um, the value in that. But, you know, to your point, Amy, like at the end of the day, it is an ad and we're, we're obviously trying to promote a product. Um, I mean, I know it sounds super simple, but honestly, like I just read the brief like very thoroughly if, if a brand has provided one. Um, you know, usually there's a lot of talking points, like way too many that you could ever try to cram into a caption or a post. Um, I kind of just like hone in on like one or two of like the messaging points that they really want to get across, but try to like weave it in, um, you know, in my own voice. Um, mm -hmm. And honestly, like I've had a lot of success with that. I most of the time when I send, you know, my captions or, um, content in for review and feedback, like the, the edits that I receive back are very, very minimal. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. I take that as a sign of like, I'm doing my job and they've also obviously reached out to me because they have the confidence in me to do that job. So um, yeah, I know it sounds like really, really simple, but just like read the brief and, um, and try to just incorporate, you know, those messages in, um, mm -hmm. in a way that sounds authentic to you. Right. In your voice. And then yes. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, how about you, Emily? Uh, I was going to say, unsurprisingly, I have similar feelings to Jamie. Um, I think that the real challenge when it comes to using your space on the Internet as also a platform for others to advertise, which is what it is, is making sure that the ads and the regular content are seamless, um, you know, in an ideal world, I don't think that your audience should be able to distinguish between what's an ad and what is just something that you posted. Right. I think that when you're working with brands, there's a lot of brands that have, uh, you know, the, the goal of reaching out to someone like Jamie or I is, is, to, is to get a message across. And I feel that through practice and through time, you are able to get the message across in your own voice, in your own way. And I have a lot of strategies for doing that. I have a lot of content pillars, kind of, de facto. Mm -hmm. I never really planned it, but it just happened because I, I operate really naturally within my space that I'm like, okay, great. If a brand would love, I, I have an example. Um, I have lots of examples. I am crazy organized. I love lists. So I made lists of examples. And I, you know, if a brand, for instance, wants to promote 
Okay, like kayak. I worked with kayak and kayak really wanted to promote this new feature where you can make guides for cities, guides about anything or guides for your own city, whatever. And so I made a guide focusing on Brighton Beach because my family's Russian and I understand Russian food and Jewish food. So I I just do my best to bring the point home mm. and relate it to something that's a part of my life. Yeah, I think great. that's yeah, I think that's a really great point. Actually, that just reminded me. Um uh, you know, I had done something with, with KFC recently and mm -hmm. it was more of like the job was actually more like a satellite media tour, which essentially means that I was like their spokesperson from the, for the day, like standing in a studio doing television hits with, you know, stations all across the country. It was to promote their, their new chicken sandwich, but it was also to, um, you know, like in conjunction with March Madness, which played really well with my sports background. Mm -hmm. Um, part of the deal was I did have to do a post. Um, and if you look at like the post I did, it, it was more sports focused than like the sandwich focus, but like, it was obvious. Like I was standing, you know, in front of like a spread of KFC like sandwiches. But I think because I presented it that way, like I got way more engagement knowing that my audience are, you know, are sports fans. Like a lot right. of people still follow me from, from the that ESPN. From ESPN. And so I knew that they would want to talk about their brackets and, mm -hmm. and that, that is exactly what happened. But but more so from that, you know, I, I got a lot of DMs as well that were like, hey, I tried that sandwich because like you mentioned it, I, like I really liked it or whatever. So I think that's the goal, right? Like it's it's an organic, like authentic, you know, fit into your personal brand, your feed. Mm -hmm. And like Emily said, making it not seem like it's out of the ordinary from the rest of your content. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, they're there because of who you guys are and they like your personalities. They like the content that you're creating. And yeah, I mean, it, it, like, it's an ad, you know, but it's a new way of telling a story to a group of folks that are already very engaged and really love you and have already become like quite loyal with you. So you're telling it um, out of your voice, which is so important. Um, how do you, about like, with the stories and the profiles, both of you have these gorgeous profiles, yeah. And um, you know, so when you're working with a brand on profile, you know, this is like like with an Instagram. Now, obviously, YouTube takes a little longer, you know. But I'm just gonna ask, like, uh, from an Instagram um, point, like, perspective, what when you know when you're working with stories at versus um, versus the posts, and you want to integrate the story specifically to you know, talk about your everyday, and then you're also talking about something that's an ad. Have you ever gotten some pushback from your audiences because they're disappointed that you're not just making a recipe or that they're not, like, you know, you two both have income coming from multiple different places. You know, you're obviously very, very active and out there. But, you know, have you ever sort of like, been like, well, you know, my, one of my jobs is being an, you know, is a content creator for brands, and I am doing this as part of, a, I am a marketer. I have, I have an audience, I make content, and you know, I'm taking your message and saying it in an authentic way. But have you ever had bad feedback or have you really been able to master that balance? And if you have, what is it that you do to master that balance so that one, the ad gets its right, you know, rightful eyeballs and, and, and engagement, um, and that your followers aren't like, come on, you know? Um, yes. So totally many thoughts. I think back in the day and by back in the day, you know, Instagram has had a limited life so far, but <laughs> let's say five years ago, four years ago, I think that the idea of ads, uh, it almost like removed the, the sheen of like, oh, this is just a person I like. And then you realize, oh, this is a business. So I do think that back in the day, there was more pushback from audiences like, oh, you're a sellout, like whatever, mm -hmm. for sure. I do think that there's been enough conversation surrounding how influence and transparency, frankly, surrounding how influencer business works to the point where the audience members who are loyal to you, who do enjoy your content, realize that by engaging with ads and by, you know, by me and Jamie taking on ads, we are essentially subsidizing, subsidizing the rest of our content because we are allowing ourselves to continue creating by finding ways to pay for those, you know, to pay for creating and um, I don't think that people care that much anymore unless you are clearly and we'll get into this later because I have thoughts but unless you're so clearly inauthentically pushing products for a quick buck 
I think that still gets pushed back. But um, a comment that I get from my audience frequently, which really makes me happy, is how authentic they how how they feel the ads just fit in and they don't detract from the content. It's just another piece of content that they're interested in that they're into. It just happened to have been sponsored by someone. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, mean, I agree with Emily. I think. Um, I honestly, like when you asked that question, I was thinking, I'm like, I don't think I've ever gotten any comments from anybody. That, no. I think it just, people just assume that that's just part of the follow, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it also speaks to the way that Emily and I both, you know, choose our partners. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I I don't really partner with brands that, that don't fit into, you know, what I do on a daily basis. Right. And, um, and furthermore, I think the brands that reach out like have done their homework and they and they're reaching out because they know that I fit with whatever their product was. You know, a perfect example um, was actually with Kindu and you know California Olive Ranch um, is an olive oil that I've been using for years. Like that was like my go-to olive oil. And so when they reached out, I was like so excited because I'm like, wait, I already use this, you know. And I think um, you know I think by being you know authentic and and really being selective with those partners that you choose, like. People under like I feel like my followers know me well enough to know that like I'm not gonna push a product that I'm not actually using, you know, aside right. outside of the ad. And and I have right. no problem, you know, if if a brand, you know, has sent me extra product and like I only needed like a certain amount for, you know, the the actual campaign, right. like, I'll continue using that and I'll continue tagging them in my stories. And I think that that can only benefit everyone, right? Because if, I, if yeah. I'm actually using it when I'm not being sponsored, mm -hmm. I think that just like speaks more to our credibility. Oh, 100%. And it's so much, you know, in, you know, influencers and those who are pretty content creators, who, you know, across all the channels really are becoming the foundation for a brand's community. And that is, uh, that is the ideal situation is when you, when you just naturally just really enjoy working with the brand. They have the brief, they've done their homework and it's just become a natural fit. And so you just start advocating for the brand naturally um, because it's just a right fit. But this is- so nice One thing. quick thing I wanna add in there with the data on it too, is that you know generally speaking, one thing that I see in the, you know, I'm looking at thousands of Kindex reports a month, is that usually at like 30% of, anything over 30% of the content, starts having a negative regression with the audience right mm -hmm. like it, that seems to me that there's very few content and creators and influencers that can do more than 30 percent of their content being branded without it hurting right. their their audience like in terms of the engagement or just like the comments start getting you know there's less comments because people know it's probably an ad you know every single time or, and or the authenticity starts you know waning because like how many how many uh, recipes can you create in a week uh, that are like really truly authentic stories or something too? So I think like that's just with what the data that I see tells us too. Right. With that. Well, also with the transparency on that, you know, I, I saw one of the comments on, about the hashtag ad, which has been, you know, now it's enforced. Um, that's being transparent though. So does that help when you're just calling it out that it's a hashtag ad? Have you felt like that's helped or? When that first became a demand, you know, um, to use hashtag ad in anything you're doing in collaboration with the brand, and um, yeah, did that? Did you feel there was a any any pullback, or do you actually think it helped because of the fact that you're being transparent? I don't know that it's it. Really happened. I, I saw followers that were like, "Oh, I didn't even know that was an ad." I'm like, I literally put ad like in the second sentence, like so. Like I don't know. If that's people, great. I mean, I think that's you know, it says a lot about like, again, like kind of blending in that content seamlessly, but I don't, I don't know. I haven't, I don't, Emily, have you like noticed anything? If anything, I have like this core audience that knows because I've spoken about it, that when they engage with my ads, they're helping me, they're helping me get more brand work. So honestly, sometimes it has the opposite effect. Sometimes if you post something as an ad, like the people who really love you be like, oh my God, great, she's getting paid, she's getting work. Let's engage with this because that's that's we'll get more work. So I really think oh, that it can be all ends of the spectrum. Moment. <laughs> that's so nice. That's yeah. So I have so to add so great. Though, um, that so it brings like so both of you are in a point where you are benefit. You know, you have as I just mentioned, you have a lot of you're wearing a lot of hats. You know, um, and so, and you've established yourself, so you can, and you're working with food um, on a daily basis in other parts of your life. So there is a natural, natural segue to collaborate with food and spirits and brands. However, um, what about like, um, you know, I, 
this is like a two-part question because I just saw, you know, I'm sure many folks saw the um, Epicurious announcement that they're not going to use beef in their uh, recipes anymore for um, for the planet. And when, you know, you don't choose a brand that, you know, you don't agree with. And I'm not saying that that's a, that's a negative thing they did. It's just, it's a difference of opinion. I think, Jamie, as you mentioned, you're from Montana. So, you know, cattle farms, I'm sure you have opinions on on that. However, let's just put that one aside for a moment because I do want to talk about that. If there's a brand who is not really um, supporting local farms or it's not supporting something organic or maybe it's asking you to um, promote a vegan diet yeah, um, and it's offering you a generous amount. I mean, we all have to be, you know, like, how do you handle that? Like, it's a little bit of a similar question to what we were just saying, but like, can you give an example of how you've had to change something to make it your own, or uh, like talk to an audience that you know it might be related to, or have you just had a pass, even though it's really generous what they're asking? I have a lot of thoughts on this one. So okay. just to just to distill right. we'll down the question, question, we make money by accepting sponsorships from brands, which means we we do not get a steady paycheck. Which means there are some times. Whereas any, you know, you need money to survive. I don't know if you guys knew that. And uh, that means that we need to get paid and we need to make money. Here's, here's what I think. First of all, if the product or the brand in question that approaches you about working together is completely off, like if a diet pill or a slim tea approached me, I'd be like, no, no way, no way in hell. That is morally and ethically not something I stand for. So that's just a flat no. I don't care how much money it is. Okay. But there are definitely situations where a product or a brand approaches you and, and you don't have like a moral or ethical thing against them. They're, they're perfectly fine. Maybe you just haven't used the product that much yet or, you know, you see that it's a good product, but you're like, I don't know how this relates to me and my mm -hmm. Instagram. Um, I have, I think this is where thinking creatively can be really beneficial. And as influencers, we have to always be strategizing, thinking creatively and thinking about how our content benefits the brand, but also benefits the audience. So one specific example of mine that comes to mind, and Kelly, if you want to share the, yeah. the, the Pepto link. So oh, yes, yes, yes. I was a, two years ago, I think, approached by Pepto Bismol to promote one of their new products, Pepto mm -hmm. Diarrhea. I had to use the word, the, the disclosures were that I had to use the word diarrhea in the caption. It, it, like we really needed to, sorry, sorry if this is too much, but we really needed to like talk about diarrhea in this ad. And I was like, okay, this is so weird. How am I, how am I gonna pull this off? I don't wanna appear as some like, some inauthentic influencer trying to make a quick buck on some like weird off brand ad. But then I really sat down and I started thinking about it. And I was just like, you know what? the idea of gastrointestinal distress based on what I am constantly eating makes a whole lot of sense. Right. It is a big part of adventuring and eating street food and eating foods your body isn't used to. It is just a necessary kind of workplace hazard for me. So I really <laughs> took this idea. I, know everyone's I, like, I love oh, it. I've been talking about, 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 talk about poop today. Um, <laughs> Everybody poops. Yeah, exactly. So okay. I ended up coming up with this whole strategy and thankfully Pepto was extremely great and so responsive to my idea. My idea was to frame the entire ad and post about after kind of my idol, Anthony Bourdain, and to talk about the fact that I'm willing to go to the ends of the earth for the best spicy momos or like the cheesiest cachapuri or, you know, the most delicious things that I've never even heard of. Cause that is, that's how I understand the world. And that's how I understand culture. And unfortunately when your body's not used to certain foods, there can be some adverse effects. And that was what the whole post was about. And it ended up being, first of all, everyone thought it was hilarious that I was talking about what I was talking about. And then second of all, because it was so, so true, like my sister, my older sister is like, you honestly, you have to do that. Like that is so on brand for you. And I was like, right. I know, but no one knows, no one else knows that but you. Um, but <laughs> we ended up doing it and it was really so many people here. And now right. I knew, oh my God. I'm so, I'm so, remember when you said we're polished? Um, anyways, I. So poised. So boys, um, <laughs> we ended up being one of the most engaged with posts of that entire year, ad or not, and in wow. a positive way. That's great. That's great. Yeah, because everyone can relate. Everyone. Can relate. <laughs> Some people think it's gross, but it's really good. And <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, <laughs> if, if listen, like I, I deal with. I mean, I think a lot of us do, especially in the food space. Like I, you know, I deal with like acid reflux and heartburn. Like if Prilosec like came 
to me, I'd be like, yes, like I use your product like all the time, you know? So I think that's a really good example. Everyone has their biz dev folks are listening or probably listening. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but, <laughs> but Emily, I cannot top that story. So I'm just gonna like, let, <laughs> let that be a mic drop on that question. Well, I think it's actually a really <laughs> good one in the sense that like, you know, a lot of times, uh, when we talk to brands, it's like, I only want this thing that's in this box. Like, don't bring me anybody else. Like, you know, we'd have, you know, for example, Pepto would maybe come to us and say, I want to have someone who's in the, the medical space, get me a nurse or a doctor, talk about it. And we're like, uh, how about some real people with like, not that nurses and doctors aren't real people, I'm married to a nurse, right? But I just mean like more of like somebody who can talk about how they're actually using it in their day to day. Mm -hmm. And that I think is one thing that for all the brands who are yeah. here today, listening, please take out of this is that the reason that these ladies get such great engagement is because they're really putting together authentic content and taking the time. And for the influencers listening, I don't know, one thing I'm listening to is how much work goes in to actually <laughs> coming up with oh, real yeah. content. It's right. not like, oh, drink hint. <laughs> you know, it's like really coming up with this stuff and, and taking it. You're through. a writer, you're a creative director, you're a photographer, you're a videographer, you're a stylist. You are, I mean, the list literally goes on. Hair and makeup. Let's, just, let's just talk, we can stay on the Pepto one. Great, uh, how long did that take? Like, just because you both are great storytellers. Sure. So you always yeah. find, like, you know, Jamie, I know, like, you've really been um, talking a lot about vaccines and, you know, and that's like something else that you're, passionate about. There's so many layers to you guys, and that's what's so great. And then obviously, um, you know, your, your lineage, you know, all of your ancestors, Emily, is, is is what, you know, really like, I think I did love that um, ad with your um, babushka, you know, who passed away. And like, but it got one of the best likes. So intertwining that um, is so important. But for brand sake, Kelly, you're right on. Like, that's exactly how it's like, it doesn't have to be so, you know, um, see, you know, match so perfectly it doesn't have to fit into the hole every single time and in fact you know um it probably it's also like as you're growing you know you're changing so the way you you know like you will be moms one day you know if you choose or you know you're, you're going to change in life and therefore your content's going to change and i think brands really need to jump on the opportunities of when those happen and think a little bit outside the box as well yeah. I mean, to, to your point, Amy, I think that you can sum up everything we just talked about with the idea that to be an effective influencer and to be someone people want to listen to, talk about anything from Pepto to whatever, mm -hmm. you just really, I know this gets, this word gets tossed around so much, but you just really have to be real. If you're being a real person, if you're not scared to be yourself, if you're talking about your life and aspects of your life, like getting the vaccine or being sad about your grandmother's death or all this other, other all this other stuff that's important to you. I remember when I was first going off on my own after being a server, trying to make a living with influencer work, I was so obsessed with the idea of fitting myself to what what brands would see. And I was obsessed with um, kind of packaging myself as this like great person for them to work with. And spoiler alert, that was not an effective strategy. And right. the only the, re the reason it turned around for me and the reason that now in 2021, it's a viable business is because I kind of threw that out the window and I was just like, I am going to focus so hard on everything that's important to me. And we're all full fast of people. Yes, our accounts are about food, but we talk about every part of our lives. And then the, then the app, then the brand partnerships that come in are so special. Cause like what Jamie said earlier, they're like, Oh, Emily loves Russian Jewish food and small businesses. Mercado approached me about doing a campaign about just that. And, mm -hmm. and once you're yourself, the possibilities are endless and the, brand partnerships are also so much more meaningful. Right. Yeah. No, I think, I think, you know, it all goes back to being relatable. You know, um, I think, you know, life is messy. <laughs> life is not perfect. And despite what some people portray on Instagram, like that is a highlight reel for the most part for people. But I think, you know, when you can like let people in a little bit, um, that just goes so much further. Like actually, I mean, just like hearing you guys all talk about that reminded me, you know, I, I posted something, I want to say it was like a month or two ago. Um, it was like this photo that I'd found from two years ago of like literally like me crying. Like, I don't even know why I took the photo mm -hmm. to begin with. And it popped up like on my time hop. And I was like, 
I feel like I want to like share this story and like, you know, just like what, what was going on in my life at that time and like where I'm at now. Um, and I was like really scared to post it. Cause like, what if you post something like that? And like, it's like no traction. Um, Cause then you're just like, okay, well that was embarrassing. Um, so, like I put my phone away for like the rest of the night. I was like, usually I'm like, you know, incessantly like checking, um, you know, to see how posts are doing, whatever. I mean, and this wasn't a sponsor post or anything, but, uh, but like, it was like my highest performing post in like, a year or something. Right. And I know exactly which post you're talking about. Yeah. I thought, right? Yeah. Like days later. The comments that I got were like, thank you. Like, thank you right. for posting this because like most people wouldn't, you know? And right. I, I really wasn't posting it like thinking that it would do well. Like I, I posted it in case somebody was going through a similar thing. And mm -hmm. like if that, if that like helped them that one day, like then, you know, that then it's worth it. But it yeah, is. I wanted to say though too. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Amy. No, it has been though. Um, like it is, there have been times where I have read, and and it has helped. It has really been relatable, you know. So I think that. Well, what was really interesting is how both of you, and I don't think everyone thinks this. You both share times where you've been a little like shy or nervous, or should I do this? And questioning yourself, and then once you decide, let's just go ahead and do it. It always works out to your benefit. But I, you know, I mean, you both come across so confident. You have so many different. Um, avenues that you can turn into and so much going on and it's just I think um you know hearing that there is sometimes some fear there is sometimes you know like shit happens you know? <laughs> like you know but there is there is some nervousness and you're checking you know like you're real people you know so it's just um I think it's really um, nice that you're showing that side because especially with you know some of the young children coming up they need to know that there is some realness, you know, and that life isn't completely perfect, you know, and I think that's a great message that you're both really putting out there. I think so, the yeah. age, sorry, I was just say, I think that the age of the like cool influencer with the cool outfits and the perfect life uh, went out the door with COVID, to be honest. Um, pretty true. over it. I've unfollowed those people long ago because I don't find them to be real or relatable. And they're uh, they're not real and they're not relatable at best and at worst they're actually really hindering young girls confidence and portraying unrealistic standards and expectations and that's just not something that i am ever interested in being and i know jamie feels the same way um and it's not even the fact that sometimes things aren't great but everything else is great and we're confident no we're real people like i there are so many times where i think you know it is interesting to me that just simply the fact that you are some somewhat of a public person just alludes to having like a great life, but that's, it's not true. Like everyone has their shit. I call Jamie freaking out, having anxiety attacks about random stuff all the time. I'm and, I think, <laughs> and I think it's just so, I think it's so important to, everyone has different levels of what they're comfortable showing. But I, like I said, I just feel that that polished, a political, a not vulnerable person that was the hallmark of Instagram for many years has has really gone away. And I want to share this quote that I turn to all the time because even when I'm worried about my own growth or my own performance on the platform, something I think about very often is a wise man once said to me, um, I was talking about how someone I knew on the platform was like exploding in followers and she always looked so perfect. She was always dressed perfectly and she weighed like four pounds even though she was eating giant amounts of food. It was all unrealistic and I was so over it and I was so upset and I just wasn't experiencing the same growth at that time. And what he said to me is like, those types of optics and those types of that type of curation has a really great immediate benefit. You, it, it does. It will immediately help you. You might get more partnerships. You know, you might grow more. You might get this like aspirational following. But authenticity takes longer to peak. But when it mm -hmm. does, it's lasting. And that is how I operate my entire Instagram life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It is. It's like, you know, it's just even with paid, anything paid, you know, um, like the paid media ads, you, know, you get the spike, but it's the organic, slow move, and they're much more loyal. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you guys about, um, like, giving some advice to brands. Uh, so when, um, how, you know, so you know, uh, there's obviously, oh, my gosh, instantly someone will say they have 500,000 followers, they have 100,000 followers, they, they, like, quickly categorize you and put multiple tags on you, you know, food, travel, this, 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 you know, all these checks. And, um, but, you know, what, what advice do you have for brands on choosing an effective 
uh, influencer and, you know, making sure, you know, because they have so much weighing on them and they want to make sure that they're getting the ROI and that they can, you know, I mean, I'm calling Kelly panicking, you know, our daily one, our weekly one-on-one is just my therapy. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's the stress, you know, as, as a CMO, as marketers that you're nervous, you know, is it going to work? And so what advice do you have to give to brands on choosing someone? Um, I think the most important thing is, you know, do your homework. Um, obviously, can do makes that very easy for brands. Um, but I, I think it, but I, but I, I, I think it's important. I really do because, um, you know, like Emily and I <laughs> like message all the time. Like, did you see this person got this ad or like whatever? Yeah. And it, and the reason, like, we're not like trying to like be like, like talking shit or anything. But it's like it's more to the point of like okay, that person might have 150,000 followers, but did the brand even look at like what their typical engagement is on a post? Like it might be down around like three or 400 likes where like someone like me, I only have like 40,000 followers, but like I consistently get double that amount. And not only that, but like, you know, if you look through the comments and like people are engaged, like they're wanting to, you know, you know, engage with you, whether it's an ad or not. So I think that that, I think that's like number one is just do your homework. I think that that like, going that extra step to see, you know, see what the engagement is, see who's commenting. Cause sometimes it's just all the other influencers. Like it's not actual real people commenting. Um, I think that that's important. I I also think, you know, if, if if you do find somebody that's a a great fit, like consider like a longer term, you know, relationship, because I think that, you know, you can post one ad and then that's fleeting, right? That goes away. People forget about it. If someone sees you consistently posting about a brand that you're clearly using, you know, in a like a long term situation, I think that over time is going to be more effective. It's you kind of have to play the long game a little bit and not be worried about like that immediate like result sometimes. Mm-hmm. Well, even with like, I think that so often, um, and we've heard this from people coming to us so often, well, they, you know, they'll look at followers and they'll look at engagement, but. To your point, looking at extra look and taking the time because that's not enough. Um, you know, like what are the comments saying? You know, how authentic are, is the actual engagement? And, you know, what are the ebbs and flows and are they real? I think what if you went one time, you even mentioned like someone might have 500,000 followers, but they were, they were following them five years ago. And how often are they actually engaged in following them now? And I thought that was a really interesting point that one of you, I mean, I think it was you, Emily, that it was just like that, don't let that number fool you because it doesn't mean necessarily that they're still as loyal because as we mentioned, life changes. It's nothing that the that the influencer did. It's just their lives have changed. Friendships come and go. Totally. Um, I I think this is a really, really interesting topic and we could dedicate a whole other webinar to it. Um, I think that, you know, I completely understand where brands are coming from. It is a saturated space. So there are certain markers that brands end up looking for. Number of followers, percentage of likes or whatever, um, categories, like these sort of kind of labels. But as we know, online and in real life, labels aren't super effective. They Mm -hmm. are helpful but they are not the whole story. So I think that if you're a brand, I, I think the, I mean, at least on the brands end, it's like figuring out who you are and what type of people resonate with you, which I think brands are doing more and more often. I will receive briefs that are like, we are really chill, authentic down to earth. We are not overly posed and curated and polished. Like that's really helpful to begin with for the brand to deduce because from there you can kind of start picking out influencers to work with that match your vibe. I think that the issue with numbers, all numbers, not even just likes, but not even just followers, the issue with the numbers is that they don't tell the full story. So if someone has 400,000 followers, but their account exploded in 2013 when Instagram started Mm -hmm. because they posted one picture of a cheese pull, that audience doesn't, they don't care anymore. Like they just don't care anymore. So if you're like all of a sudden trying to be like, wait, listen, watch me advertise whatever else, like, please care about me. It's like you, you need to grow a whole different audience because they came for a cheese pool in 2013 and that is not what they're getting anymore. So I think that's why I, and Jamie and I think exemplify this, this like slow and steady growth and personal authenticity. You know, I, I think that there's a lot of accounts that back in the day, especially when Instagram started, they, 
they box themselves into a certain category because they thought it would be successful. Mm. And that's not long standing. But guess what? Being you will always be, a, you know, that will always be a viable category. It's just right, not right. achieved. So there's just, I have a lot of thoughts on it. I don't know. Yeah. I, I want to just like piggyback real quick on that too. I think the other thing to look at is the content itself. And, and, and I don't, I do mean like the photos and videos and the quality of that, but not just that. Like if you're, you know, if you're a food brand that wants to, you know, showcase your product um, with a food account, like why are you choosing someone that just goes to restaurants and then now mm -hmm. they're trying to bumble their way through a recipe. Whereas like, yeah. like if you, you know, you choose somebody like me and Emily who are literally cooking at home all the time because we enjoy it mm -hmm. and we can come up with like unique and interesting recipes that are actually something that somebody would try to recreate at home right. and also integrate that product into the content. So it feels natural. It's I great. think that that's really important as well. Yeah, I no, agree. No, no. So, so we're gonna pivot to uh, Q and A. We're gonna pivot okay, to Q and A. Okay, we can keep going. Yeah, so, I know. Yeah, I know. And I was like, we could fill like, so much more time. We'll have you back. Because there's so much to go on. But we can do it. Swiping stories part two. Yeah, we will. We will. We have to do a reunion with our premiere for sure. So first question I want to do comes from Matt, and he wants to know advice that you have for small brands appealing to influencers who are you know limited on a budget potentially uh there's a there's a few people who've asked a similar question around that so you know they're emerging food brands um which i can tell you i see a lot of those so i would love to hear your opinion on what's the best way they can appeal to get you to work with them and, and help them out with and of course not free because we don't believe in any kind of offers here because so we would never ask you to do that but like what's the best way for them to get the most bang for their buck i guess Small influencers are great. They tend to have hyper engaged audiences that are newer, like the influencers that have probably come on the scene more recently, which kind of goes back to our point earlier. They're, they've probably accrued their audience semi recently. And so those people are mo more likely to be engaged. And this is another classic example of, you know, the numbers not telling the whole story. I think it's important to find, you know, whatever your budget is, you figure that out. And it, it you kind of just have to find the, type and the follower the the range of influencer that it makes sense for your budget and within that all the same rules apply what do they post about why do they post it what do they like but i think it's about you know if you have a, a limited budget first of all i agree p approaching people for in-kind partnerships is kind of on its way out uh just because we you know unless people do things as a hobby, unless like the smaller influencer is just posting about food as a hobby and they might like really genuinely want your product. There are times where that applies, but generally speaking, it's a no go. Um, it's just about finding a follower, you know, category of number of followers that makes sense for your budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, I don't want to, I know we have a lot of more questions, so like, we can just move, move on to the next ones, but yeah, I think, I think targeting, you know, a, a smaller, like, account um can actually have sometimes a bigger impact because mm -hmm. as i said those 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 followers are, are much more engaged in that person rather than you know a huge account where maybe they charge a lot more but you know it's not going to have like a direct impact on on like actually influencing people to to go out and purchase that product yeah definitely so i there's a question here from uh somebody who sent and said hey after they're using the influencer and like working with them you know the accounts are suffering from the drop off and how do they reverse that so i'm just going to jump in on that and say like one it can't just be one type of content like you've got to engage and you definitely need to be um you know posting yourself and the, the all of the content needs to align with layers. So, you know, it's not just about having an influencer come in and promote your brand either. You also have to be doing the work to engage and keep the audience afterwards. Um, and so, if, you know, the, Tim, if you want to know more information about that, sign up for the demo. We can talk about how we can help you with that too. Um, what kind of engagement uh, content do you find gets the most engagement or what are some unique uh, ways that you guys have incorporated? Like, for example, Jamie, I know with the California Olive Ranch one, you did like an IGTV like cooking episode. You know, and I know you guys both do like some really cool stuff. What are some of the interesting ways that brands can leverage influencers to what the type of content that you've seen is like, this is new, this is hot and it's moving really well. Yeah. I mean, that, that was um, something I did a lot of um, definitely early in quarantine last year because, you know, right when everything shut down, like, you know, I knew that I was going to probably 
you know, a lot of my stuff was going to get canceled as far as like my, my TV, like studio stuff. Um, so, you know, credit to my boyfriend. Like he was like, we need to be doing Instagram lives like every night. And so we did, we did it for like three or four weeks straight. And then we kind of like tapered off to like three or four times a week. But within that stretch, you know, I brands took notice. I probably did four or five campaigns that were really based around like doing a live cooking demo, which I think like speaks very well to, um, you know, obviously like my television skills, you know, I also host classes for Food Network Kitchen app, which is essentially doing the same thing, just a little bit more produced. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I still get, I still get comments from people that are like, oh my gosh, your IGTV or IG lives got me through, you know, quarantine and that kind of thing. So I think yeah. just, you know, being, being flexible and being will willing to like think outside the box a little bit, um, is I think is super helpful. Awesome. And then I know that we had a question in here specifically, Emily, they want to know your opinion about having the amount of calories on items, you know, stated on menus versus, you know, products itself, like in there. And do you guys ever address some of the calorie uh, type of stuff, especially with heavy foods that are consumed uh, in there? Um, I don't have a problem with brands or with uh, restaurants or, you know, typically fast casual kind of chains listing calorie counts on menus. I think that's totally fine. I think it's great. I'm always all for transparency. As far as the content I create, I'm not claiming to know anything about nutrition and it's just not like part of my, 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 it's not part of my uh, expertise in food. And sure. so I can stay away from that. Um, in that vein, you know, a lot of people ask me like, Oh my God, how do you eat so many carbs? Again, I stay away from, I will answer. That's why I'm very transparent about my life and how much I work out and the way that I, and I post like my boring, boring like lunches sometimes or breakfast that are not aesthetically pleasing. But I, I hope that that gives a more well-rounded picture of what my nutrition is like. I don't feel the need to discuss actual nutritional facts on mm -hmm. menus. Yeah, no, I think that's great. You know, I, there's a lot of like um, posts out there. I think that I love when I see people say like, I don't know, you you can look up all the ingredients and put it in too. Because I think it's like, you know, buyer beware. Like this is, <laughs> I'm posting pasta, but like I'm not saying eat pasta every day, right? Like, yeah, I stay but, away from that. I'm saying eat pasta every day because it's delicious, <laughs> right? Like why not? Kind of too. Yeah, go for it. So um, then I think one question that before we wrap up here, I want to definitely uh, get to one for the influencers. is like, hey, have you ever engaged a brand yeah, and like, yeah. how do you go to the brand and ask them to work with them? Like, what's your pitch to them and how do you get them to, to yeah, say yes? And look at this as your moment also, they might be listening. So <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition, who have you approached and who do you want to approach? Besides oh, wow. Um, geez. I mean that I, 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 I if I could prepare like a list, that would take up the whole hour. Um, I'll send you guys a brand wish list later. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I will follow it up with the question. I think the number one, thing, number one thing is like, don't DM them. <laughs> try to find an email for somebody. Um, I try to like really encourage people, even brands that are reaching out to me to do the same. I put my email in my, I have it listed in my Instagram for a reason. Like that I think is the a more effective way. Um, sometimes it is like an easier path to get to people that way, but um, yeah, I think just like obviously like identifying brands that you're already using, things that you would love to work on um, and and pitch them ideas and, and ways for you to work together. But I can't I actually can't think of like a specific example of a brand that I necessarily reached out to and then it results. I'm sure there was one, but I like off the top of my head, it's not coming. Yeah, we we'll get back to them like that. I, yeah. what about you? I agree with um, Jamie. I so there's, I am a very, very proactive person. So I by no means sit back and hope that everything starts rolling in um, until like, at least in, especially in the beginning of making influence work my primary income, obviously through time, things kind of stabilize, but I reach out to brands. I learn so much about the brand. I'll find a contact, I'll email them. I will go into detail about the types of recipes I would want to make for them and why, who I am, why I'm uniquely qualified to make this recipe, et cetera. Like I have a very holistic, large standing approach when I pitch brands and I have seen success that way. Another thing I do is I, I like to do is get to learn get to meet everyone at the agencies, the PR agencies, the digital and the advertising agencies, like 
right before the pandemic, I was literally going on like two meetings a week with different agencies to, to put my face in front of them. Because again, we're in such a saturated market, the more you can do to get your face in front of people, to meet people and to really, really something I try to stress all the time when I work with brands, whether I approach them or they approach me is why me? What makes, you know, why would you want to work with me? Let me tell you why. Well, I can think of thousands of reasons why <laughs> we want to work with both of you. Really, you're so so impressive. I mean, we re we do have to have a part two yeah. on our on our on our year anniversary. Yeah. So, um, just to be sensitive to people's times, I just wanted to do you know a little recap here. So, read the brief. Um, definitely read the brief and put your time into the brief. Yeah. You know, um, and in, and brand partnerships are really, really probably the most effective, long-term, organic, you know, don't just go looking. And for influencers, don't just be posting content that's gonna get that quick spike. You really gotta put your own stories. And I think, you know, you could spend hours thinking of how much content when people are worried about their content, you know, um, you know not being enough. It's like, there's so much we talk about every single day. You definitely are gonna be have to. And the fact that you two get nervous, I, I love that. You know, I have to say, because oh, right you know, I'm like, no, <laughs> People are gonna. If I say that, they're gonna be like, "What are you doing right now?" Like, <laughs> if I posted something like that, so I love it. And I mean, um, last but not least, you know, shit happens, right? So <laughs> we'll end on that note. But I know there's some promos. But please, folks, follow at Jamie Seer, Sire. Excuse me, okay. J A Y M E E S I R E, and at Food Lovers Diary. Look for your YouTube and your cookbooks. And check out the podcast, Food Network Obsessed. Kelly, I think you yes. other things. Yeah, so we put the links to your guys' Instagram in the chat. So, folks, make sure you follow them. Uh, we are, I put some opportunity for you to sign up for a demo. This will replay if you want to rewatch it or share it with a friend. It'll also be on our YouTube, uh, which was somewhere in the links uh, in the chat at some point in here. And then this uh, sign up for our next uh, webinar is already up there. Uh, it'll be on May 20th with Hello Teffy, uh, who's a personality with like TikTok and some YouTube events too. So uh, thanks so much. And ladies, thank, thank you so you. much for joining us. It was just as great as I hoped it would be. <laughs> and uh, I absolutely adore both of you. And I'm so grateful Back for your friendship to, to Kindu. So thanks so much. <laughs> thank, thank you guys. So nice to you. Everyone have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.